All right, so we are finally getting to talk about the proteins. So that would be the last part in this biochemistry unit. So proteins are made up of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and sulfur. These are polymers, so they are going to be made up of smaller units called monomers, and specific units are going to be amino acids. So amino acids are going to be joined together by peptide bonds. So now proteins carry out a number of different functions. They can be enzymes, they can serve in the defense as a defense mechanism, meaning they can be antibodies in our immune system. They can be storage proteins. They can transport things. As you can see, this guy right here is embedded in the membrane and is allowing for some molecules to pass through. They can also be hormones such as insulin, and they can be receptors, recognize signaling molecules. They can be motor proteins and also produce contraction in the, in the case of the muscle movement and um, and as well, and, and then also we have structural proteins that's going to provide that structural support. So you can pause here and just read a little bit more about it and uh, have a general idea as far as how diverse the proteins have to be. So now the basic building block of a protein is an amino acid. So an amino acid will consist of an alpha carbon. Alpha carbon will have carboxyl group that's joined to it. And then also on the other side, you'll see there is an amino group. Now, a very, very important side chain that's going to give a, an amino acid its unique property is the actual R group. So it's called side chain. So now, what do these properties are? Well, I mean, what do they, what do, they do and what are these properties like? So we have um, nonpolar side chains. They are hydrophobic, and you can see there's a list of amino acids that will have those chains, and they all colored in yellow. And then we also have polar chains, so these are going to be hydrophilic amino acids. And then we also have acidic that are negatively charged, and then basic that are positively charged. So it means these R groups are going to be interacting to produce a specific 3D shape in the protein. So I'm going to zoom in and show you what's going on here with the nonpolar side chains and want to remind you what makes them hydrophobic. So if we look at this example, for example, um, let's look at alanine, right? So we have alanine. So the purple part is the backbone, the basic skeleton of an amino acid. It's the same for all of them. You can see they're exactly the same. But the R group is different. So this one has a CH3 group. And then how is this hydrophobic? Now remember that carbon wants to have four bonds. So you will always have hydrogen here, here, and then here, and then another. You can have obviously carbon all over, but there's going to be four bonds. So in this case, there's my alpha carbon. Do you see it right here? And then the alpha carbon is going to be bonded to the CH3 group. So there's the one bond, and then you're going to have three hydrogen around. So one more, one more, and then one more. So we, act, we have accounted for four bonds, one, two, three, four. So it means this is it. This part is going to be, uh, it will have low affinity to water. So we're going to call it hydrophobic. And then you can examine and count the carbon um, and the bonds in between and see if you can um, understand why these are um, hydro hydrophobic. Okay, so an example of hydrophilic would be serine. You see right here, it's colored in green, and then we have oxygen, so there is the hydroxyl group, so that makes it hydrophilic. So, and um, some of the other amino acids will be acidic because they have the ability to drop off the hydrogen, remember, and then the basic ones will have the ability to pick up the hydrogen from the environment. So therefore, they gain that charge. Now, do you have to memorize every, every single amino acid and what property it has? Absolutely not. What you need to be able to do, if I show you an amino acid, you should be able to tell me, okay, I see why this would be acidic. I see why this would be um, hydrophilic in that way or hydrophobic. Okay. So now let's talk about how do we actually build the polymers. So the process is called, besides... Um, besides dehydration synthesis that has to that has to happen we call it polymerization so if you take one amino acid notice that the carboxyl group right here in this region we have hydroxyl right and then of the other amino acid we're going to take the amino group that offers the hydrogen so we've got HHO that forms so we really are looking at water so you can see water is being released and then the bond between this carbon and this nitrogen is going to form. So what is the name of this bond? The answer is peptide bond. So here you go. You have peptide bonds that link up amino acids into a chain. And if you want to break down a polymer, a polypeptide, what you need to do is add water, H2O. In other words, you're going to do hydrolysis to digest this protein. 
So I uh, want to talk about the protein structure and function. And um, we need to understand that unique shape in the protein is going to be very important. That 3D dimensional structure is going to be determined by the actual sequence of amino acids. And then the protein is going to fold into this complex, somewhat gnarly looking structure. You think, oh, it looks really messy, but guess what? There's nothing messy about it. It's very organized and it has to be very specific because it will be carrying out a very specific function. So proteins are actually organized in four different levels. So we call that primary structure. That's first level. Then secondary structure and tertiary structure. And some of the proteins are also going to have quaternary structure. So let me go over these different structures right now. So the very primary um, structure, the very first one, that first level of organization is going to be just a chain of amino acids linked by peptide bonds. So if you remember the necklace, that beautiful necklace I showed you in the class, um, it just looks like little beads on a string. So that is basically the primary structure of a protein. So one end obviously is going to be amino end, the other end is going to be carboxyl end. And um, again, what are they linked by? By um, this peptide bond going to be linking them together into a chain. It doesn't have a shape yet, it's not functioning yet, but it is that first level that you get when the ribosomes assemble a protein. So next what happens is this, the formation of secondary structure. So secondary structure is going to result from hydrogen bonds that are going to form between the N amino group of one amino acid and carboxyl group of the other amino acid. So I am going to take a look and see, hey, look, here we've got alpha helix coiled type of structure, that's secondary type, or they can coil uh, in a form of beta pleated sheets. So if you look right here, we have a hydrogen bond, and hydrogen bond is going to be happening between the, between the oxygen and hydrogen. So this would be oxygen, and this is hydrogen. So and then if you look at the, and then here's another hydrogen bond. And then if you look at the beta pleated sheet, you're going to see this right here. This is your hydrogen bond. So we've got rows of sheets, rows of amino acids. And now they are folding this in a different way. And you can see this right here is your oxygen and this is going to be hydrogen. So there's this partially positive, partially negative attraction that forms a hydrogen bond. So the bottom line is that secondary structure results from hydrogen bonds. And you can make two different shapes, alpha helix or beta pleated sheet. So now this is where the fun stuff begins. This is where the 3D shape is going to result from interactions between the R groups. Remember we said every amino acid has an R group. And the R group is going to be unique. So that means at this point, the R groups are going to be interacting, coming together, and they are going to cause that linear, um, and then uh, that linear shape of a protein to, to become uh, or gain that 3D shape. So it's going to twist and turn and fold in all kinds of different ways. So I'm going to give you different types of bonds that are going to occur in tertiary structure. Uh, structure. So number one, you are going to see some hydrogen bonds, obviously between oxygen and hydrogen, they are going to be interacting. And then we're going to see ionic attractions. So this is where you have charged side chains. You know how they can be positive and negative, so they're going to be attracted to one another. And then there, there will also be hydrophobic interactions if you have a lot of hydrophobic R groups aggregating together, meaning folding away from water, sort of trying to hide away on an inner part of that protein because water is all over the place. And then van der Waals interactions are going to stabilize uh, to, is going to stabilize that 3D shape and it's um, those partial positive and negative hot spots that occur. And then we're looking at very stable covalent bonds that are going to be happening in tertiary structure. And I had already mentioned in the past that we have a very special amino acid that's called cysteine. So cysteine has what we call sulfhydryl group. So when the two cysteines come together, you see what's going on here? We release the hydrogen and we are going to have the formation of covalent bond that is called a disulfide bridge. So this is the strongest bond right here in that keeps the tertiary structure together. And uh, if you look in this picture here, you're going to see how we have this ribbon, this primary structure, right? And you can see this would be your alpha helis, helix, and then you've got some uh, beta pleated sheets. Um, this is not very clear on this picture, but you can see our groups are interacting. So this would be hydrophobic because you have lots of 
uh, metal groups happening here and then um, rings and then you've got this, um, the sulfide bonds, these bridges that are very strong and you can see there's some hydrogen bonds and even salt bridges. These are the same, obviously your ionic interactions. Okay, so here's another look of those different types of bonds that are happening in tertiary structure. So hydrogen bond, you can see between the oxygen and hydrogen, hydrophobic interactions, they're all hanging out away from the aqueous solutions. These are your covalent bonds. You can see how it causes that ribbon to fold like this because they come in together. So it causes that fold. And then ionic bonds, that means between partially po between the positive and negative charge of our groups of different amino acids. So and then um, quaternary structure is not going to be present in all the proteins. Uh, quaternary structure results from when you have two or more polypeptide chains. And a good example would be hemoglobin. So this one is the one that helps you carry the oxygen um, in the blood. And you can see it's actually made up of four units. So we have alpha, alpha subunit here and here and then we also have beta subunits so they kind of all come together into this globular structure okay so just to illustrate that proteins can have different shapes and the way they fold you can see like this one myoglobin it would have a lot of alpha helices here and this one would have both alpha helis and beta sheets so you can see um, um, I don't know if you can see it right here, but this one would be the beta sheet, and then the spiral-looking structure is the alpha. And then you can see lots of beta sheets here in the in the antibodies. So the order, the actual order of amino acids is determined by your DNA. So you have a gene, specific gene, that codes for a specific protein. So what if you have a mutation in your DNA? So that means you are going to have an incorrect order in your protein. So that protein, I mean, in, in that chain of amino acids to make a protein. So that means that protein might not fold correctly and they may not function correctly. So an example of such mutation is sickle cell disease. So what we have in sickle cell disease, the normal gene codes for the following right here, the following primary structure. You can see they're all listed here and you can see uh, position number six, this amino acid is supposed to be hydrophilic. However, it's replaced with valine, which happens to be hydrophobic. So now we have a little bead that is not correct in that chain. So what happens now when you try to fold the protein, the protein is not going to fold correctly. So the normal one, you would make kind of sort of roundish looking beta subunit and then you put them all together and you're looking at round red blood cells, do you see? But if there is a mistake in the DNA, there's a mistake now in the chain of amino acids. So you can see now the hydrophobic region is shying away from the water. So it causes this caving in in the, in the protein. So therefore, the resulting red blood cell is going to have this sickle shape. So you see it's not actually not round. So imagine if you have very thin blood vessels and they're trying to get through in a single file. If when they round, it's no problem. But when they like this, that's a problem because they can actually get stuck. And then so some of your organs may not get oxygen and you've got internal organ damage. So sickle cell disease is a serious, serious condition. Again, as I said before, what determines the protein structure? It, the answer is going to be primary structure, which is obviously dictated by your DNA. So, but then, how the protein is going to fold is also affected by physical and chemical conditions that the protein is in. So if we change the pH of the environment, salt concentration, temperature, or any kind of other environmental factors, we can cause the disruption in the bonds that were happening in the tertiary secondary structures. So we're going to cause that protein to unravel and lose the actual shape. So you notice that there's going to be a loss of secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structure. So when this happens, we say protein has been denatured. So imagine if you took an egg, um, a raw egg, and you boiled it. So it means you increase the temperature, you cook the egg, and then what does it look like? Very different from the original one, right? Because the original was the unboiled egg is, looks slimy, kind of little gooey. And then if you cook it, then it's very, very solid and it has a white color to it. So you can see the protein structure has been 
um, the the protein structure has been affected. So we say the protein has been denatured. So and most of the times when the protein is denatured, that could be permanent. And uh, there are cases when you can renature if you restore the original conditions. And uh, I wanted to point out specific environmental factors and what effect they have on the protein structure. So that way, when you have this, when you have to discuss a protein structure, you're not just going to say, oh, you know, the structure has been changed, so now the protein has been denatured. You are going to be specific what it does and what kind of bonds are being disrupted in quaternary, and tertiary, and secondary structures. So you can pause here and take a look. I have discussed the pH, what happens when you change the pH, what happens when you change the temperature, even alcohol, when the protein is exposed to alcohol, and then salts of heavy metals, ions, and, and such, okay? And the very last part, this is really cool, proteins get help as far as folding. So there are special other little proteins that are called chaperonins that are going to help in proper folding of other proteins. So you can see um, the polypeptide, newly um, synthesized polypeptide, is gonna go into the middle of that chaperonin. Looks like um, some little machine here, right? And then it provides this perfect environment on the inside, so the protein is gonna fold, and then you can see it leaves, and then it's gonna carry out its functions. If that protein is not, if that protein is not folded correctly, what happens is there's going to be what we call a death tag that's going to be added to it. So it's going to be tagged to be degraded so that we can get rid of it. And uh, But sometimes you will have diseases that, you know, doesn't get rid of all these misfolded proteins and cause an organism um, great harm.